Thank you for joining us today. This is being recorded, so please be aware of that. It'll be available on our website uh, to be uh, reviewed at later points. And if you know people who wanted to participate but they weren't able to, hope you let them know about the uh, uh, recording. Uh, I want to introduce uh, our speakers. Uh, ben Becky, as I said, uh, formerly our VP for policy. Ben now directs a very exciting program, the Washington Cares Fund at the State of Washington's Department of Social and Health Services. Uh, Robert Espinoza, the Vice President of Policy at PHI International. Uh, Robert is also a member of the Academy's Board of Directors. Dr. Pamela Nadash, the Associate Professor of Gerontology at the University of Massachusetts in Boston. And our moderator will be Alexandra Bradley. Alexandra works with the Academy on Health and Caregiving Policy. Then when the webinar ends, we'll continue the discussion on our new website uh, that I hope you've had a chance to look at. We're very excited about the website. We'll have a caregiving research section that will contain relevant work compiled by Academy members and staff, including the universal LTSS report that is the focus of today's session. So with that, let me turn it over to Ben Vecti and Ben will uh, take us through the top level findings of his uh, uh, report. Ben? Thank you so much, Bill. I'm so excited to talk with you today. Thank you so much for inviting me, Bill. Uh, I appreciate the work the Academy does in this area. And um, it's so critical that we develop better solutions for, for our older adults and people with disabilities who, who need better uh, long-term services and support. So why should we care about this topic today? Um, um, today, I'm gonna talk, start with that to, to sort of refresh our minds about what the problems are that we face give a quick overview of approaches abroad, and then go into some depth about each one. Um, talk about different ways that these different approaches deal with shared challenges that all um, industrialized countries face in this area. And finally, um, look a little more in depth at, at the case of Germany and what we can learn from their system. So, um, and before I, I go further, let me just be clear that my analysis here is my own. It does not represent the views of the Washington State Department of Social Health Services. And also let you know that this is based on original research. Um, I did semi-structured interviews with senior officials and stakeholders in the German long-term care and care leave systems. They have a specific system for, for paid leave for, for the long-term care space. In addition to a review of legislative documents, administrative reports, and program data, as well as interviews with experts in the Netherlands, Japan, and South Korea. So why should we care about this, uh, uh, about LTSS programs abroad? Well, all Western industrialized countries, and I mean, all industrialized countries, all OECD countries, um, face the same set of challenges. Um, all of these countries are facing an aging population um, and a decline in the stay-at-home caregiver due to a complex set of changes that mean that most households or the vast majority of households need all adults working in order to make ends meet. Um, and in the United States, we have uh, a set of policy tools to deal with long-term care that are no longer sufficient. And many would argue they never have been sufficient. Um, most middle-class families fall through the cracks. The current approach is that um, uh, assumes that most families have enough money to buy um, to meet all their long-term care needs through the market by taking money from their earnings and purchasing long-term care either out of pocket or by prime private, private long-term care insurance. But only about 7% of households in the U.S. have on, private long-term care insurance. Um, only the, the median uh, retirement savings for families approaching retirement is $4,200. So half of households approaching retirement have less than $4,200 in combined pension or 401k IRA savings available to them. And so most families are struggling to maintain their living standards in retirement, much less pay for health care, much less pay for long-term care. So our current set of policies um, are insufficient. At the same time, um, our counterparts in other countries are facing the same sets of challenges and have developed policy uh, tools to address them. And I think we can learn a lot by looking at those. The approaches abroad can be categorized in four, in three categories, and, and then a fourth, which is a hybrid. One is a so social insurance approach. Second is a universal comprehensive approach. The third is a means-tested residual approach. Um, and the fourth is, is hybrid. And we'll, I'll go over those one by one. Um, the social insurance approach is prevalent in the Netherlands, Germany, Japan, South Korea, and now, now also in Washington state. Um, it is funded in whole or in part by dedicated contributions by workers and or their employers, as well as pensioners. 
Um, it offers near universal coverage. Um, and we can talk about that more later. There are modest benefits. Um, the benefits are, the exception would be the Netherlands, which has actually the most generous system in the world. Um, but for the other countries, the benefits are modest. It's a, a capped entitlement where there's a right to a certain amount of benefits per month. Uh, they're not, it's not time limited, but it's per month. And the family, families are expected to pick up the remainder cost. Families or, or if the families can't afford it, then the social uh, assistance program for long-term care in, in each of these countries. A second model is universal comprehensive coverage. This is prevalent in the Nordic countries. Two examples I cited in my report are Denmark and Sweden. Um, it was developed in the 1940s uh, and persists to this day, funded by general revenues. Uh, it views coverage as a social right. And so um, uh, everyone is covered um, and it's true universal coverage. Uh, and benefits are generous and there is no or, or minimal financial participation on, on behalf of beneficiaries. A third model is a residual means tested approach. Um, this is the approach in the United States in our Medicaid system also in, the U in, in England. Um, there's some variation within the UK and the brief goes into that in some depth, but uh, it is funded, these are, this approach is funded from general revenues but not as a universal social right, but as um, uh, the assumption here is that most people can pay for long-term care out of pocket or through private insurance. Those who, who can't um, need help from the government and um, they, are, uh, they have access to these programs. A hybrid approach exists in France and to some extent in some Southern European countries. Um, it blends these different um, the different approach, it, it blends the social insurance and universal approaches. Um, in France, it's, it's funded by general revenues with a small social insurance component. Um, the social insurance component is that companies pay into a national solidarity fund for autonomy, um, the wages they would have, that they would have otherwise paid to workers for a day that had previously been a holiday. So Pentecost Monday was a holiday for a long time. When it was um, rescinded as a holiday, employers put that money into a, into a national solidarity fund that goes towards long-term care. Additional funding comes from a small tax on pensions, but for the most part, it's funded through um, from uh, general revenues um, in a uh, allowance for personal autonomy, the APA, that was introduced in 2002. Um, it provides cash payments to all those 60 or older who need long-term care. Um, there's no means test, uh, but, but benefits decrease as income increases. So the highest earners receive only 10% of the maximum benefit for their disability level. Um, private insurance plays a big role in supplementing the public program. And Pam has published on that, Pam Nadash, and she can talk about that uh, in her remarks. Something to keep in mind in, in studying all these systems or looking at them is that we're, it's, it's, we can learn from them, but we can't import them. Um, national approaches to long-term care cluster around the, the first three types that I mentioned. There's an extensive political science and political economy literature around those types and around the typologies. Esping Anderson, a, a Danish sociologist, um, was the, the pioneer in classifying those systems. Uh, he called them worlds of welfare capitalism and classified them based on a few different factors. Um, political culture plays a role. Um, it's, his factors are uh, deg degree of decommodification that the systems have, which means the degree to which a person's welfare depends on wage labor, um, social, strat social stratification, which is the degree to which social policy reinforces or mitigates social inequalities and social stratification, and then the public-private mix of welfare. Um, another, there's another literature by Eb Ebbinghaus and Manow kicked it off in 2001, which looks at institutional complementarities between uh, industrial labor relations, the system of finance in a country, whether it's patient capital or inpatient capital um, and, uh, and social policy. The point, the takeaway from both of these literatures um, is that each, a given country has its approach to social policy based on historical factors that are deeply rooted in their system, in their political economy and in their political culture of social policy. And so um, you can't just import a policy from another country and expect it to work here any more than you could import a tree from Panama and expect it to take root in, in, you know, in, in Northwest Washington. There are a set of factors that make these programs thrive in the countries where, where they exist. 
And so when you're looking at the learnings that we can have are really more about learning discrete uh, policy mechanisms or tools or approaches, and then weighing whether those could work in this country, given our political culture, our political economy, et cetera. So you have to be, take everything with a grain of salt when you look at these countries and their models. Um, the countries that I looked at uh, have divergent approaches to shared challenges. So let's, let's take a look at some of these challenges and how they were addressed. The first is coverage. The universal comprehensive approach covers all uh, members of society as a social right. Um, social insurance, the social insurance approach covers all, the who, all those who contribute and invest. But interestingly, the countries that practice the social insurance approach, the, the main driver, the main leads are the Netherlands and Germany, the subsequent programs build off of the German system. Um, those countries manage to cover nearly everyone through this approach. And they do it through a couple of tools. Um, one is in the German system, for example, they cover non-working family members um, uh, as part of the wage earners coverage. So if I'm working and my spouse and children are not working, they're covered by my contribution. If my spouse is also working, then she pays in um, uh, as well. But if she's not working, she's covered. And uh, the vesting period is only two years in Germany. In Netherlands, there's no vesting period. You're, as soon as you're paying in, you're eligible for coverage. So short vesting periods, covering family members. Another way they cover everyone is by having pensioners pay in, which uh, earns them coverage after two years of paying in as well. So they've, ma they've managed to cover virtually everyone um, uh, through a social insurance approach. The residual approaches only cover those with low income assets. So they differ radically from the other two in terms of coverage. Um, the transition cohorts is another issue that uh, is a challenge, but most other countries have covered, in fact, all other countries have covered everyone immediately. There has been no um, transition of, you know, some not people not being covered. Granted, there's a two year vesting period in Germany, but it's pretty short vesting and most people most people are, are covered uh, almost immediately. And so um, that's an interesting change from in, in our program in Washington state, um, there's a 10 year vesting requirement and retirees are not covered today because they haven't paid in. And then those close to retirement still need to vest before they're covered. So that's an important difference. Start and duration of coverage is another interesting aspect. I know in the United States, there's a big uh, discussion about whether there should be front end, whether a front end or back end approach makes more sense. The Washington State program is a front end coverage program where you're covered from the first dollar of need uh, up to a maximum of $36,500 of lifetime benefits. Um, and I know that the WISH Act, which was recently introduced uh, based on a you know, plan that was developed by um, Mark Cohen and Judy Fader and others, um, would provide back end catastrophic coverage to people where you pay in out of pocket for a while and then the program kicks in or maybe you can buy private insurance to cover that intermediate period until the program kicks in. In other countries, it's important to know that this debate doesn't exist. Every program covers, has a, a tempor temporarily unlimited coverage duration. So there is no front end versus back end in other countries. What they do to control costs is have a monthly cap on benefits sometimes so that there's a, it's a capped entitlement, but it's, there's no time limit. Financing is another issue um, where um, uh, the differs of the key differentiator between in this categorical scheme that I've presented here. Um, I touched on that previously. The main difference is that the universal comprehensive approaches are tax financed and, um, uh, and so are the residual approaches. Social insurance approaches are, are financed through worker contributions, sometimes matched by employers. Integration with healthcare or integration generally is another big challenge. So, um, uh, and Howard Gleckman has talked about this extensively and, and written about it extensively. This is a, the ch a challenge that has not been solved anywhere yet adequately. How do you integrate long-term care with healthcare? Um, in the, the Netherlands has perhaps come closest to addressing this challenge by in their recent reforms in 2015, they, they put home, uh, home care into their health care system. So their health, their health insurance system rather now also covers home care. They're trying to integrate that um, home health care with, with personal care there. Um, and that is, in, that is succeeding to some extent, although there's other challenges that they face with that restructuring, which the brief goes into more detail on and we could address in Q&A if it comes up there. Um, benefit type and setting uh, is another issue that, is, that differs across countries. The first universal long-term care programs in the Nordic countries in the Netherlands uh, began with a strong emphasis on institutional care. The goal there was to move responsibility for care from the family to society so, th so that to unburden female labor market participation. 
So this entailed a focus on service benefits rather than cash benefits. Um, J Japan introduced its system in 2000 with the slogan, from care by family to care by society, which is similar to what the Nordic countries and the Netherlands have been doing. Um, but they focused on professional home care as well as professional institutional care. Because by, by 2000, the discourse internationally had moved away from institutional care towards home care. Um, so Japan kept it a focus on professional care and service benefits, but with both a home and an institutional focus. Most OECD countries, um, in, including the United States, have focused on rebalancing towards home care since the 1990s. Um, in countries with conservative social policy regimes, such as Germany or Austria, public policy is designed to give families more resources with which to tackle care challenges, rather than public policy taking on this responsibility through professional care. So cash pay, benefits play a big role in Germany as well as Austria. Um, Japan and South Korea, uh, while adopting the German model in many respects, rejected cash benefits largely due to concerns they would reinforce gendered patterns of work and care and reduce female labor market participation. So what are some high level lessons from Germany? First, let's look at some positive lessons and then some lessons from challenges Germany has faced. Um, the uh, positive lessons are that fixing a market failure, which is the, the inability of um, the inability of the free market to address the long-term care needs that families face um, is uncontroversial and can win broad public support. So in Germany, the, the new policies in this area, the, the universal social insurance program has been extremely popular. There's support for premiums. Premiums have gone up a couple of times and there has been broad public support for that. So I think that's an important takeaway. Robust, but robust benefits are possible with a modest fiscal footprint. So Germany has this capped entitlement with a capped monthly benefit. It provides meaningful benefits to everyone, but with a, mo a modest cost. They spend less than the average in terms of GDP on long-term care. Um, they have, it's a con contributory program that achieves near universal coverage. So I think it's important to note that if you structure it right, um, a social insurance approach can achieve near universal coverage. Um, they covered seniors out of the gate, which won broad political support, and also eased the burden on social assistance budgets, which in our country would be the Medicaid budget. That's an important concern of policymakers um, and politicians, for that matter. Um, requiring premiums from seniors permanently broadens the tax base. So that's important to keep in mind that if you only have workers and their employers contributing, um, you have a limited tax base to the workforce. But if you also have uh, premiums for seniors, you're broadening the tax base. Um, flexible public programs can increase families' choices and options. Um, Germany provides a cash benefit, but also in-kind benefits, service benefits, or a combination. So families can choose what kind of, uh, based on their own algorithm of what they want to do in terms of either having a loved one care for the, the, the person or having a professional caregiver, they can choose that. Um, and another important lesson is that designing the insurance benefit structure in isolation is insufficient to serve the program goal of benefit adequacy. In Germany, they focused on the capped entitlement, what they thought was a reasonable benefit. They learned over time that because the costs in the long-term care sector, particularly the nursing home sector, went up much faster than the benefit was going up, that um, the benefit was no longer sufficient. So cost control and policy innovation in this area has to look not only at designing the, the public policy program, the social policy program, but also at a policy designed to control costs in the long-term care sector as a whole. Um, some lessons from challenges in the German example, or German experience, um, meeting beneficiary long-term care needs, addressing the care workforce shortage, ensur ensuring quality jobs and quality care, and controlling costs, and hence the, the premium rate, are often competing challenges. So these are all goals of good long-term care policy, but they are in competition with one another to some extent. So, so there's trade-offs there that need to be taken into account. Secondly, the long-term care workforce shortage is a complex challenge in Germany and abroad. And I know that uh, Robert will speak to that. Relying on family members to quit their jobs is not feasible for most families and has major disadvantages for a variety of reasons. And for that reason, um, uh, in addition to having a long-term care social insurance benefit or other kind of benefit, uh, a robust care leave policy is needed. And traditional paid family leave is, is helpful, but it may not be sufficient. You may need longer periods of leave and Germany is now considering up to three years of paid leave at a partial wage replacement uh, in order to allow a family member who um, is caring for someone with dementia, for example, to leave the workforce and come back. Um, they're considering that now um, because they've, they've determined that the, 
they're having trouble getting enough care workers to meet the, the workforce need, <clears throat> and a, a paid leave policy could be a surrogate uh, workforce policy. Finally, um, a, a pay-as-you-go financing approach uh, where you pay benefits out of existing revenues um, uh, requires that as, as the age wave hits and as the population ages, that you either increase premiums or cut benefits. And so that, you know, having an approach that isn't funded um, is challenging as the age wave hits. Uh, Germany tried to mitigate this with a long-term care provision fund, uh, which where part of the premiums now go to a fund that only helps people in 2035 on, uh, but it's still a challenge for them. A statutory mechanism is needed to ensure that benefits roughly keep pace with the rising cost of care. So in Germany, initially, they didn't have a mechanism for incre increasing benefits with inflation because they were trying to control costs. But that means that over time, the benefit levels uh, erode their purchasing power. And so they, they had reforms later that tried to, to mitigate that. And finally, cash benefits bring a risk of reinforcing inequalities. Um, when you have cash benefits, families can hire people at substandard wages, hire people who don't have good uh, labor force protections, don't have benefits themselves. Um, and it can also encourage uh, women to stay to, to reduce their, their workforce participation, which can reinforce gendered patterns of work and care. So for all of those reasons, while cash benefits give greater flexibility to families, they also bring a host of problems that policymakers need to take into consideration. Um, so with that, I'll pass it to Robert. Thank you, Ben. Also, thank you, Bill, and the National Academy of Social Insurance for hosting this conversation and for including me um, in this conversation about um, direct care, specifically the workforce implications um, and universal LTSS programs abroad. Um, just as a quick introduction, my name is Robert Espinosa. I'm the Vice President of Policy at PHI. Um, we are a national research advocacy and workforce interventions organization that's focused on strengthening the direct care workforce. Um, I also serve, as, as Bill mentioned, on the board of directors for the National Academy of Social Insurance and I also on the American Society on Aging. I think as we discuss international approaches uh, to universal long-term care and what states can learn from these models, um, I'll be focusing my comments specifically on the workforce implications. I'm going to start by describing the value that direct care workers in particular have on the long-term care system with U.S. data and examples. Um, and then I'll speak to a few points in the report and how they compare to our experiences in the U.S. And I'll close with a few implications. Um, as, as context, uh, the promise is really that a workforce conversation is relevant to any discussion on long-term care, social insurance, or universal coverage um, for reasons that the report notes and that Ben mentioned, which is that workers are critical to how the system functions. Um, and there are a variety of workers, and the, while, while there are a variety of workers in the U.S. healthcare system in particular and in many countries, um, it's often direct care workers who are the paid frontline of support for older adults and people with disabilities. However, because of poor job quality in the direct care workforce, um, this workforce often struggles with high turnover and workforce shortages, which makes that accessibility uh, for, to, to long-term services and supports um, is impeded by the fact that simply people simply can't find good workers. Um, so in essence, a social insurance program that really aims to enhance affordability should also be designed in such a way that it improves access. And that's primarily through ensuring good jobs and direct care. Um, just a few points on the direct care workforce um, to situate this conversation in the US. Um, there are about 4.6 million direct care workers who work in a variety of settings in private homes, in nursing homes, and in residential care settings. Um, they support and deliver services to millions of older adults and people with disabilities. Um, and our research shows that they are mostly women, they are largely people of color, and they are increasingly comprised of immigrants. Our research also shows that one in four direct care workers is aged 55 and older. So as our country ages, so is our workforce. And that has implications for how we design age-friendly workplace environments, not just settings across the country. Um, I should also note that our research and most of our analysis as a sector on direct care workers um, doesn't include the gray market where many consumers 
um, are often forced because of affordability concerns um, to reach out and access workers. And we can assume that a large percentage of workers in the gray market um, are also undocumented immigrants. Gray market is of course where um, people, individuals um, hire uh, workers basically off the books and create their own kind of workplace and work arrangements. Um, and we can imagine that while that might benefit in a financial way, it's also ripe for explo exploitation and abuse. Um, these workers make about $12 an hour uh, as a median wage. Um, and that wage has remained virtually stagnant over the last 10 years. And because of low wages and part-time hours, about 45% of these workers live in or near poverty. They also struggle with limited training and advancement opportunities. Um, they deal with misrepresentation presentations of being low skilled or unskilled work when in fact this work requires a good amount of training um, and they're generally devalued and poorly recognized and we saw this have seen this during the COVID-19 crisis where we deem these workers as essential um, but really only offered hazard pay or temporary training supports um, really for, during the height of the pandemic and we have seen most jobs um, across the country in the sector revert back to the poor quality that they have long struggled with. Because of all of this and because of growing demand, we estimate that the long-term care sector in the US will need to fill about 7.8 million jobs in direct care. Um, and about a, a little over a million are new jobs that are being created, but a large percentage of these openings are workers um, who are leaving this sector uh, for other industries like retail or fast food. So this is a crisis both on the workforce side and on the consumer side for older adults and people with disabilities. Um, I wanna highlight a few points from the report on designing universal LTSS programs and lessons from Germany and other countries. And I just wanna spend a few minutes discussing those points because I think it's relevant for how we talk about what's comparable and what's, what are areas that there might be important differences that we should, we should discuss. Um, the case study specifically in the section on Germany in the workforce policy section, which I believe begins on page 36, um, discusses the role of migrant workers, mainly from Eastern Europe. Um, it acknowledges that across Europe, there have been, and in Germany, there have been workforce shortages that are caused by the gap between older adults who need these services and who are increasingly growing in, in numbers um, and the available workforce supply. So Germany and probably other countries as well um, have begun thinking about how do we bring workers from abroad um, to fulfill temporary stints. Um, and many of these workers either live with families, although others don't live with families, so they're uh, living or not. Um, the other point that this section makes around migrant workers is that the government often looks away quote, to substandard migrant care work arrangements because these benefit families and some argue benefit these workers as well, even though they are experiencing substandard wages and working conditions in Germany, they are earning more than they would in their home country. Um, and this is something where I, I do believe this would take us a little off topic, but if we were to have a conversation about how our country has historically dealt with immigrants, I think there are some comparable themes here, right? We have a tendency to both benefit um, from the labor of immigrants in a variety of sectors, including direct care and home care in particular. Um, and yeah, at least in the US, the, the, the discourse and the policy approach um, to undocumented immigrants in particular is generally hostile. And so I think we need to struggle with sort of how do we reap the benefits? How do we support immigrants? Um, and how do we move kind of through and past some of the biases we might have about immigrants? Um, in the U.S., um, I want to speak to a, a few dynamics um, that are similar with some notable differences. Um, in the U.S., immigrants are a major part of the long-term care sector. About one in four direct care workers is an immigrant. Um, we can also assume that, again, that in the gray market, where consumers are hiring workers kind of off the book, so to speak, that immigrants, and specifically undocumented immigrants, are a big part of that workforce as well. We can imagine that consumers, undocumented immigrant consumers, are also part of this sector. Um, what we have seen in the US from a policy focus is a number of proposals that are trying to address different aspects of this. So for example, advocates like Leading Age and other organizations have pointed to the possibilities of strengthening the pipeline for direct care workers in this country by creating some form of temporary legal status or a foreign born guest worker program 
where essentially it would be a time limited guest worker program that would allow qualified English speaking foreign born individuals um, to enter the US to work in positions in LTSS with the assumption that those positions cannot be filled by native born workers. So that's the premise of the argument that's being put out. Um, workers would be admitted to the country for a fixed three year period, which could be renewed one at a time for a total of six years. Um, and there would be ideally in the proposal wage and training guarantees so that these jobs are stronger in quality in some dimensions. I mean, we would argue that there are op opportunities for us to explore a temporary time limited guest worker program, but we should learn from previous guest worker programs in other industries in terms of what has worked and what hasn't. Uh, we also believe in strong worker protections um, so that employers are not exploiting these immigrant workers. And for workers who choose to want to remain in the US once this thing is over, there should be some pathway to citizenship and we should think about how to promote those opportunities. Um, that pathway to citizenship, by the way, um, is the premise of another bill, which is the US Citizenship Act of 2021, um, introduced in January, which, you know, if enacted, would provide lawful prospective status to about 11 million undocumented immigrants, including essential workers, such as home care workers and nursing assistants. And here is where we would encourage Europe and others to also think about what are the ways in which, as countries, Countries, we simply want to acknowledge that direct care workers are essential workers and might deserve kind of an easier or streamlined approach to uh, legalization, so to speak. Um, also, there are already quite a few immigrants in this country who are undocumented and who are a big part of the sector. And how do we think about supporting them and how to create, we create programs that are specifically aimed at supporting immigrants in home care. So we've profiled, for example, in the past, um, a program that's in New Mexico out of an organization called Encuentro, um, which is it's a 15 week program that's conducted in Spanish. It provides enrollees with scholarships to cover the cost of tuition and childcare. And it trains specifically home immigrants to become home care workers. And it provides kind of pathways to employment. And I think from a policy perspective, we can think about that. Um, the report that we're referencing today also spoke about a, a German federal policy roundtable that developed a policy framework to make care work more attractive. And they spoke about kind of a number of elements in the final recommendations, including the need for more care workers, better pay, more funding for the entire system, expanded vocational training, more responsibility for workers and more digitalization or IT strategies, right, that would support workers. Um, we would certainly argue for all of those and we see that within the US. Um, we would also argue that in addition to better pay, we also need workers need full-time hours, better benefits, et cetera. Um, we often need specialty training. Workers need specialty training in areas such as dementia care is one example, um, or li cultural linguistic competence. Also support for supervisors, advanced roles for workers, um, stronger data collection systems so that we can better understand where there are workforce gaps or just the general needs of workers and a wide range of innovations from caregiver registries that connect consumers to workers, which would be especially helpful in a national long-term care social insurance or universal program because it would help connect people based on their preferences, their needs and their availability. Um, the final point I'll make quickly is that just to emphasize that the importance of both learning from Europe and, and other parts of the world, but also sharing our own ideas about what we're learning here. Um, and also the importance of probing additional questions. How do we create a national social insurance or universal program in LTSS that looks at equity issues across race and gender, immigration status, et cetera. What have we learned during the COVID-19 crisis about what should remain and what should just go away? And how do we better make the argument that while these programs can be quite expensive at the onset, and that often raises eyebrows for people in policy and actuaries, um, it, they often have many economic benefits in the long term. And we've seen this with workers in particular, where strong jobs lead to reduced turnover which is expensive and improved care outcomes, um, which can uh, save quite a bit of cost in the system. Again, thank you for including me. Um, I look forward to hearing from Pamela and Alexandra as well um, and to the conversation that follows. I will pass it on to Pamela. Hi, thank you so much. That was such a fantastic um, contribution of so many issues. And I think um, also, you know, Ben raised so many issues in his um, uh, conversation that 
uh, you know, you want to probe into all of them. But I'll just start out by sort of uh, reinforcing Ben's point about you know, he, he made the point that you can't just take a long term care insurance program and plonk it onto the United States. And he talked a lot about um, kind of social cultural values and people people talk a lot about that as well. But I also want to sort of point to some of the structural and institutional reasons why you might not be able to take a long term care um, insurance program from another country and plonk it onto the US. And just to sort of point out um, some of the interesting tensions that exist in the German program. So for example, um, you know, Ben referred to the fact that there's this sort of safety net social assistance program that if people are unable to cover all their costs out of the benefit, which as he mentioned, it, it's it's a fixed written, you know, it's a fixed uh, across the board, everybody gets the same amount at the same disability level. Uh, it's a fixed amount. Um, and it's not adequate to cover the full cost of care. So what happens to people who are less well off who um, can't afford that? Well, they're going to have to, um, they will end up on the social assistance program. Um, and, and, and it was, you know, it's in, the social assistance program actually preceded the long term care insurance program in Germany. And um, just like in the United States, there is a tension between central government and, um, and, and, and the, what they call the launder there, which are the um, German equivalent of states. And interestingly enough, the social assistance program was run by the launder. And because this, the social assistance program was getting so expensive, there was pressure to create the long-term care insurance program. So um, it's an interesting sort of tension. Again, you know, kind of like Medicaid in the United States, where the states are responsible for people who are less well off, and central government is covering universal programs that benefit everybody. And the other part of this that I, I kind of want to point to, the other structural factor, is is also that um, you know the long-term care insurance program isn't run by one central government unit. Rather, it was built upon the existing health insurance system. And um, if you know about the German health, um, um, public health insurance program, it's not actually centralized. It, it's run by insurance funds. Similarly, um, the long-term care insurance is, is um, separated out and it, it is uh, operated through these long-term care insurance funds that kind of um, are built on the existing health insurance funds. So again, there's this infrastructure that the program um, um, built upon already. And so every long-term care insurance program in different countries has to accommodate the existing structures and programs that already exist. Uh, and, and, and also the cost of the program is going to depend in part on the boundaries between the long-term care insurance program and the other kinds of programs that are out there and how you split out the liability. I'm going to come back to this a little bit later when I talk about benefits for family caregivers. Um, but first, I sort of wanted to go talk a little bit more about the flat rate benefit structure of the German program. And just sort of to sort of emphasize, you know, Ben made the point later on about uh, the somewhat regressive nature of the, um, of, of the program. Now, he has a former colleague named Heinz Rocking, who, who talks a lot about the German program from a very critical point of view. And his sort of line about it is that um, the goal, you know, we think about what is the goal of a, of a public insurance program for LTSS? Is it to, um, to help those who are worse off, who can't afford the cost of care, to protect them against financial damage? Um, you know, what is the goal? And in, in Germany, when they think about their programs, it's not necessarily, when you think about a conservative welfare regime, which Germany is classified as, you know, it's really to maintain the status quo. And it's not necessarily to assist those who are, who are worse off. So the people who criticize that program criticize it from that kind of its regressive impacts. And the flat rate benefit structure means that, you know, people who are less well off have you know, it doesn't cover the full cost of care, so they're left, um, you know, in a difficult situation. And I also did want to point out one other thing, which was, which is that 
Um, universally, long-term care insurance programs don't necessarily, um, they, they split out what they're doing between covering the cost of care and the cost of room and board. And very often these programs only cover the cost of care. They don't cover the cost of room and board. And the families, again, are left responsible for the cost of room and board if somebody moves into institutional care. Um, so, you know, just an important thing to keep in mind. Um, so, you know, Ben talked about the cash benefit in Germany. And I, I just wanted to sort of clarify that when they pay out the cash benefit, it, it, they, they, um, the dollar value of the cash benefit is about half the uh, value of in-kind services, roughly speaking. And the other interesting thing about the, so, you know, so why would anyone take the cash benefit if it's less than half the cost? Well, you know, uh, part of it is that, you know, families who need income supplementation, um, so they're happy to take the cash because they need the money. Uh, and they reckon they can figure out how to care, provide that care, you know, within the family. So, uh, you, you know, the concern is that um, women end up picking up the slack by paying their, playing their traditional role. So, so that's kind of the, the sort of feminist critique of the um, cash benefit. Um, the, the other thing um, that Robert talked a lot about is the use of the gray market. Because the formal labor supply is so low, in Germany, a lot of folks have been relying on what they call the gray market in care and hiring people from Eastern Europe. Uh, similarly, Austria has been uh, having the same issue. Uh, you know, one of the other papers I wrote was about Taiwan. And it was really interesting to me to see that um, they, at the time when I did the paper, uh, they said that 95% of the care workers in Taiwan were from other countries, Indonesia, Vietnam, Philippines, et cetera. So this is a, a universal problem that a lot of more developed countries are having, that they cannot find the labor supply and they're importing it from other places. Um, and that, you know, as Robert so eloquently pointed out, you know, we really need to be concerned about the working conditions, um, you know, protecting these people, um, you know, because, you know, there have been a lot of abuses for that population. Now, France has taken another approach to this. And um, it was interesting that, you know, when I was writing that paper, they, there was talk about um, using the long-term care insurance program that they were developing at, in, in part as kind of um, integrating it with their labor policy. And the idea there was that there are a lot of marginalized populations in France. I'm sure you're aware of the, you know, a lot of the racial and um, issues that have been going on in France. And in any case, there are a lot of unemployed people who needed work. And so the, um, the long-term care insurance program was meant to sort of partly address that labor shortage and to uh, bring these people into the formal workplace. And they have a mechanism for ensuring that people are paid appropriately called the, um, I'm gonna uh, botch the pronunciation, Czech Employee Service Universal, which is um, basically any kind of domestic worker gets paid through this system and it ensures that taxes are paid and social security and so forth, you know, that these people are brought into the formal work system. Uh, so I'm commenting on that because, you know, part of me, uh, you know, there's concern about how cash payments are used from many quarters. And to me, a lot of it has to do with the political will to, to ensure that the money is used appropriately. What people always comment about in the German system is, oh my goodness, they don't care what those folks do with their money. You know, they just hand out the cash and people can spend the cash on whatever they want. You know, that's crazy from an American perspective. Um, anyway, I'm going to stop talking about that and talk about the caregiver policy. And the, the main point I want to bring up here, people are very typically look at the German program and they talk about the wonderful um, caregiver benefits that are paid through the program. So that includes social security contributions for people when they take time off to provide supportive care. Um, uh, they contribute to their pension fund. Um, they pay fully for short term leave. Um, the longer term leave currently is being is paid out of a loan. You uh, essentially you um, borrow the money from your employer and pay them, pay them back. 
And uh, Ben and I were talking about this prior to this, and he was commenting that nobody's taking this up for obvious reasons. And it's obviously regressive. You know, nobody wants to take on debt if they're not fairly well off and confident of continued employment. But the key issue there is that, that those benefits are paid for out of the long-term care insurance fund. So let's think about that. Do we really want caregiver benefits paid for out of an LTSS funding mechanism? Or do we want caregiver benefits paid for out of other sources? For example, here in Massachusetts, we had um, expanded um, uh, FMLA essentially, and it's um, a little uh, proportion of uh, additional tax on workers. Um, and similarly, uh, uh, other family caregiver benefits are paid for out of other buckets. Um, and, and the advantage there, let's think about this strategically, politically, so forth, is that family caregivers of older people and people with disabilities are then in a bucket with um, parents and um, kind of a larger um, constituency. Um, and the benefits are seen as part of, of, of the whole kind of family caregiving from every angle. Uh, perspective, rather than being taken out of the LTSS budget. Um, so that's the main thing I want to uh, point out with respect to um, Germany's caregiver benefit, because there's a lot of movement right now, both on the LTSS front and on the family caregiver front. I should comment that I'm um, working to support the Raise Family Caregiver Council and helping to develop a national strategy right now, so I'm very aware of those issues. Okay, I think I've taken up my 10 minutes, and I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Welcome back, everybody. Um, really appreciate all the speakers for everything you brought. And I think we're going to be switching to our Q&A section now. We only have a couple minutes. So um, if folks don't mind uh, keeping their answers brief, I want to try to get to a couple of these questions. Um, the first one, I think um, perhaps we could start with Robert, but uh, everybody could probably speak to, um, which is what is a feasible pathway to cover undocumented individuals in a universal LTSS program? Um, what is needed to ensure that this population is covered? For example, in California, one in every 10 California workers are undocumented. Yeah, I'll, I'll take a first stab at it, but I, I'll be curious what my fellow panelists have to say. I mean, I think, you know, part of the challenge, I think part of the answer is what I mentioned earlier, which is what is our overall national approach to undocumented immigrants and providing a pathway to citizenship. And certainly the U.S. Citizenship Act of 2021 is kind of the, the most current thinking, at least, you know, in this administration about how to address it. And it is by acknowledging both that there are, you know, at least 11 million undocumented immigrants who would benefit from how the administration has articulated that policy. Um, and also the value of, of acknowledging that immigrants are, are essential in, in workforces. And if they were essential during the pandemic, they deserve some kind of essential support as immigrants. Um, I do wonder, and this is a question for my panelists, is if there's anything unique that an LTSS universal program should do to support undocumented immigrants, but I would imagine it's connected to however the federal government deals with undocumented immigrants, supports undocumented immigrants. Thank you, Robert. Ben or Pam? Yeah, I would just say that, um, you know, you could cover people just based on the fact that they've paid in rather than based on citizenship status. So as long as you don't exclude them explicitly in the statute, there's no reason why you couldn't cover them if they've paid and invested. Wonderful. Um, we had another question, um, and I tried to answer this a little bit in chat, but um, this is a long question, so I'll try to synthesize. The largest population that uses these services are persons living with disabilities, not seniors, um, and they often require birth to death services, um, while seniors typically only use LTESS or LTC for five to 10 years. Um, so why aren't we including persons living with disabilities in this study? Um, and I already did note that there are some countries that do, but I'd love everybody to say a little bit more about the difference between the countries that do and don't include folks with disabilities and how that plays out. Sure, I can take a first stab at that. Um, and just to say that, you know, this is an incredibly complex policy field. And so you have to, when you're doing, when you're writing a report, you have to focus on a research question. And so when you, especially when you're comparing countries, you have to have a, some, an, a something you're comparing and you, you can't compare. I mean, you could have another approach would be to, to include health insurance as part of the comparison because that's relevant as well. Health, health, home health care is relevant as well. And 
you could do, but that would have taken 10 years to do that study. So um, the, so I, I picked for this study a particular focus. I could have picked a different focus. Um, the Netherlands and uh, Germany do cover um, uh, all people with disabilities and not just seniors. Japan and South Korea uh, focus their programs on the aged or people with aging related uh, disabilities like dementia um, if they're 40 or older, roughly. So um, uh, there are a whole other sets of policies in each of these countries, in a, even, in a, even in the Netherlands and Germany, it's in addition to the long-term care policy that are focused exclusively on people with um, disabilities, either of working age or with developmental disabilities. And that, that is a complex set of policies. Most long-term care insurance policies are not enough to meet the needs of that population. And so it's really a separate research question. I don't know if Pam or Robert want to speak to that. Yeah, can, can I just say, I mean, this is always an issue, like how does the country set these things up? And that's kind of what I was referring to when I was talking about boundaries, because that has an impact on cost. So, and, and it creates all kinds of, so you can think of, uh, if you put everybody together, it's a bigger political constituency um, and people can potentially lobby for better benefits. On the other hand, you know, in, in Australia, for example, the um, program for people with disabilities is much more generous than the program for pe older people, right? So what happens when people transition from that program to the older program? And do they want to open up the aging, you know, program and make it more generous? Well, that's going to cost a lot of money. There are all kinds of interesting issues around whether they should be kept separate or combined. I think that's a great point that most, the best policy in this area typically has um, a more economical policy aimed at the older population and then a more generous policy available to people with disabilities. And most of these countries have very robust policies for people with disabilities. Thank you for that. Um, I think this is probably gonna be our last question. I'm gonna blend together my question with something from Mr. Weston. Um, as Bill talked about earlier, Representative Swafi from New York just introduced the WISH Act, well-being insurance for seniors to be at home. Um, which would create a federal catastrophic long-term care program. Um, is this the most practical legislation now that Congress is really talking about this? Um, is the Better Care HCBS Act, which would expand Medicaid a better option? Um, what are the pluses and minuses? Which uh, policies have better merit? Um, and also, Jonathan Weston asks, when will it be too late for us to act on the aging in America? Um, I can, oh, go ahead, Robert. Sure, I'll, I'll answer it quickly, which is that, you know, certainly the American Jobs Plan, American Families Plan, or the infrastructure package, so to speak, um, and the Better Care, Better Jobs um, Act um, have the most attention, and that way it would invest the $400 billion in HCBS and improve wages for home care workers. Um, but there are a number of other bills um, that could do quite a bit to support at least the workforce side uh, of this equation. There's a package of bills that would bolster the training infrastructure for direct care workers. I, I won't say the names because they're so long. Um, but there are a variety of them. There's the Direct Care Opportunity Act as well, which would fund about $1 billion in workforce interventions um, to support direct care workers. There's the recognizing the role of direct support professionals, which are workers who support people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And there is a Dom Domestic Worker Bill of Rights Act as well, um, as well as the WISH Act. But there's, I think, a lot of energy at the federal level right now. Yeah, I think all those are important. Robert just mentioned, you know, improving wages in the sector and job quality is, is critical to addressing the the workforce issues that, that he addressed and also that Pam discussed in other countries. All countries are struggling to have enough quality workers. And the obvious solution is to pay people enough to let the free market do its magic and draw people into the field, right? If you're paying people sufficiently, you will draw young people like my son, who's 17 years old, is trying to figure out what he wants to do in his career. And if this is an attractive career, people will go into it. Um, in general, I just think we, it's welcome that there's there are initiatives and all, all these initiatives are welcome. More needs to be done here. I think we need structural solutions um, that are not simply expanding Medicaid benefits, but also for a lot of permanent structural solutions so that the broad middle class also has access to care. Uh, because there are a lot of people that are that are make that have too much savings to qualify for Medicaid, uh, but are still desperately need help. Um, and that has devastating consequences for families when when people have to quit their jobs and, and, and spend through their life savings and then a spouse survives and has nothing to live on. And, and that's those are devastating situations. I mean, the, the WISH Act is a back-end catastrophic plan. 
that is predicated on private insurance or other means filling the gap for the first couple of years. So I think that's a challenge. Like, how are you going to fill the gap for the first couple of years? That would re require a robust private insurance market to fill the gap. But by having Beckett catastrophic, you make that assurance more affordable. Um, the question is, can everyone afford even the affordable insurance? Then, um, you know, um, a, a front end approach like Washington States covers everyone for part of their long term care trajectory for the first portion of the journey, um, with the idea that people then go on Medicaid towards the end of their journey if they can't pay out of pocket for the last part. So these are different approaches. I think they're all welcome. The main thing is we need to have some kind of structural solution uh, in, this, in this area, both for benefits and uh, improving worker protections um, as the bills that um, Robert mentioned are, are proposing to do. And did you have no anything to add? Okay, well, it sounds like the answer is we need all of them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we need all kinds of solutions. Um, well, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, the Academy will be sending a follow-up email with the recording um, as well as some other information, um, links to the brief. So please um, feel free to reach out um, with questions or comments post-webinar to nasi at nasi.org. Um, and with that, we will say good day. Thank you everybody for speaking um, and everybody do it, who came to attend. Have a wonderful day. Thank you so much. Thank you.